I want to talk about set theory from a Fragian perspective rather than Frege from a set theory perspective. So I'm going to be talking about uh, about some Miller-Franco set theory looked at through a kind of Fragian lens. And so let me begin by mentioning, of course, one of the uh, important distinct, uh, 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 distinctions that Frege makes is between concepts and objects. So one could describe by saying that we're setting up this sort of realm of objects, that's the domain of discourse, a universe of individuals. Uh, and for example, when we make statements with quantifiers are taken to range over that, uh, over that realm of objects. And then kind of on top of that realm of objects, we have the concepts, which one can think of as, in effect as predicates, subsets of the domain, um, and a given object or individual either falls under a concept or does not. Of course, Frege describes this with this sort of course of values, the characteristic function mapping the individuals to the true false values, but one can think of them as kind of predicates. Uh, and one of the things that Frege sought to do, right, was associate every concept with an object uh, called the extension of the concept, and that was going to be the object that represented the concept. And in this way, he could treat concepts as objects, in effect. Uh, and so this extension terminology today, to me, and to, I think to many people, carries this connotation, connotation of uh, a collection of some kind. The extension of a concept is sort of the set of positive instances or the set of individuals that fall under that concept or the class of objects that fulfill the uh, predicate. And I'm not sure to what extent, uh, and maybe the Frege scholars can say something about that in the question session, to what extent Frege conceived of the extension objects as collections in that sense. Of course, he defined what it means, the membership relation and so on via his interpretation, but did he really conceive of the extension object as a collection? Perhaps he did, but I'm not quite sure. His basic principles don't seem to require that. Um, so what, what he really wants is just, of course, that the extension objects uh, are what I call a conceptual invariant. They should be the same for equivalent concepts. So this is, of course, basic law five, which says the extension of a concept F is the same as the extension of a concept G if and only if F and G are uh, conceptually equivalent. So they, they determine the same course of values for individuals, they determine the same predicate. Okay, so this is the kind of equivalence relation on concepts F and G. And what this basic law five is saying is that the extension assignment uh, to, of an object to a concept is an invariant for that equivalence relation, meaning that equivalent concepts get the same object and inequivalent concepts get different objects. This is exactly what it means to be an invariant for an equivalence relation. Okay, so because of this, he's distinguishing between concepts being identical and concepts having the same extension because you can have, you can describe the same concept uh, they might be different intentionally, but extensionally, if they're equivalent, then they're going to get the same extension object assigned to them. Okay, so uh, as I think almost everyone here must know, Russell's famously cred uh, credited with refuting Frege's system, and he forms the Russell set, the, the set of all sets that are not self-membered. And if that is indeed a set, then R is going to be an element of R if and only if it's not, which is a contradiction. Okay, so this way of doing the contradiction is really aimed uh, at using the general comprehension axiom rather than basic law five. And I'm gonna talk in detail about the, how one formulates the Russell argument using basic law five uh, itself. But part of the point of my talk is that one has to say uh, much more and not just basic law five alone. Um, okay, so, Russell pointed out that the logic of his argument is nearly identical to Cantor's proof on the power sets, namely that every set is strictly less than the power set uh, in size. So A is less than the power set of A. And uh, as I'm sure is familiar, we can just do this argument quickly. So if we label every subset of A with a different individual of the domain, that's sort of like assigning an extension object to that set. Uh, so X of A is a different subset for every individual A and all of them are represented. Then we can form the diagonal subset of all individuals that are not members of the set that's named after them. And that's a perfectly good subset of A, but it can't be X of A for any particular A because little a would be in that diagonal set if and only if it wasn't, if D were equal to X of A. So that's essentially identical logic to the Russell argument. Uh, and this is how Cantor had proved that the power set is always getting bigger. 
Okay. So the, the Russell paradox can be seen, therefore, of course, as the assertion that in any domain of individuals, there must always be more predicates on that domain than there are individuals. That's a way of understanding Cantor's theorem uh, and Russell's use of it in the Russell paradox. Uh, okay, but basic law five seems exactly to deny that way of talking about about it because basic law five is setting us up to assign to every predicate F this extension object, the extension of F. And so it seems like it's directly violating Cantor's theorem. Okay, uh, Russell highlighted this puzzling propositional formulation of the paradox, namely there must be more classes of propositions than propositions. Uh, and yet it seems for every class of propositions, we can form the proposition asserting that they're all true. And it seems for different classes of propositions, maybe that's a different proposition. And Russell was confused about this, but of course eventually gave a perfectly clear account of it along the same lines as the Russell paradox and the Cantor theorem. Okay. Uh, so despite all that, uh, I want to discuss how zermelo franco set theory nevertheless exemplifies the Fragian perspective, and actually I'm going to prove that it fulfills basic law five, uh, and furthermore in a deflationist manner. Okay. So let me start by saying the standard treatment of sets and classes in, in ZF set theory instantiates the fundamental features uh, of the Fragian distinction between object and concept, namely, uh, I'm sorry, but second, I'm gonna argue that it does so in a way that we get basic law five and also the Cantor Hume principle and all the other Fragian abstraction principles as consequences. Uh, and it's going to be deflationist in the sense that I'm gonna give definitions of what the extension of a class is, and then I'm gonna prove in ZF uh, that basic law five holds. Uh, and similarly with the other abstractions. Okay, so what is the sense in which we're uh, implementing the distinction between object and concept in set theory? Well, if we view the cumulative universe as a domain of individual objects, the sets, we have the cumulative hierarchy of all sets and we view each individual set as one of the objects in our domain of discourse. Those are the objects in this Fragian realm of objects and the set theoretic quantifiers range over that domain. So these, when I say for all X, we mean for all sets X and there is a set X. Uh, and we can make various assertions in the language of set theory about that domain. This is just the ordinary language of set theory in which one can implement all kinds of mathematical ideas using, the, using set theory as a mathematical foundation. Okay, using that language of set theory, we are able to express the concepts about the sets being an ordinal, being transitive relations between sets, being equinumerous, two sets being equinumerous, or X being the power set of Y, and so on. All of the various uh, uh, set theoretic concepts are expressible in that language, uh, and, and we can view uh, those uh, definable properties as forming uh, the realm of concepts in this Fragian way of looking at it. Uh, and so to provide a concept is simply to express it in the language of set theory, possibly with parameters. Um, and uh, so we have these definable classes. Those are the concepts. The sets themselves are the objects. The definable classes are the concepts. And I think this accords uh, quite well with the kind of Fragian perspective on what's going on in set theory. Um, and furthermore, many set theorists operate in set theory in the way that I just described. For example, Andreas Blas states explicitly that proper classes are not part of the set theoretic ontology. They are not objects. Proper classes are not objects, he says. They do not exist. Talking about them is a convenient abbreviation for statements about sets. For example, V equal L is abbreviating the statement all sets are constructible. And if proper classes were objects, they should be included amongst the sets and the cumulative hierarchy should continue much further but in fact, it already continues arbitrarily far. So the idea is we're building up the cumulative hierarchy of sets. And if, if we wanted to do class theory and have the classes as actual objects, then it's just showing that we stopped too soon. We should add those classes as sets and continue building the cumulative hierarchy higher. Okay, this is his view. Um, 
So only the sets of the objects. And then the classes are just basically a way of talking about predication on the sets. So Kanamori also has a similar view in his book on large cardinals, The Higher Infinite. He takes exactly this, uh, this way of proceeding in set theory. So for example, when he's talking about the Kuhnin inconsistency, which is about whether there's an elementary embedding J from V to V, and that is of course a proper class sized object. Uh, the Kuhnin inconsistency says there's no such non-trivial embedding, but uh, Kanamori says he, he views it as a scheme of theorems, one for each J, meaning that J is definable and he's proving that no particular definition can work as a definition of such a class J that would fulfill the Kuhn inconsistency. It's a sort of strange case actually to concentrate on this theorem with that view actually, because it, it turns out that it's much, much easier to prove the Kuhn inconsistency for definable embeddings than it is to prove it in the general case. So it's an open question whether you can do it without the axiom of choice, for example, in the general class theoretic case. But it's not open if you know that J is definable, then there's a very easy argument that refutes it, which doesn't require any of the difficult combinatorics of the Kuhn argument. Okay, so what I wanna do now is prove that basic law five holds in Zeta and provably so using this way of understanding the object concept distinction. So we're gonna take CF as the theory of sets and we only consider definable classes, definable in the first order language of set theory using parameters, set parameters. Uh, and so to, to fulfill basic law five, we have to provide for every such definable class an extension object, the extension of F, and we have to do it in such a way that we fulfill the, the invariance property that to con uh, the concept of F is equal, I mean, the extension of F is equal to the extension of G if and only if F and G are extensionally equivalent. Okay, that's what I wanna do. Uh, and, and if we can do that, then we'll have achieved this association of classes with objects and fulfill basic law five. So here's a slightly more formal statement of the theorem that I'm claiming. Uh, namely, there's an association of definable classes with objects uh, and that association is furthermore definable in the following senses. So if you give me explicitly a definable class by give it, telling me the formula phi and the parameter Z that you use to define it, then the property of being the extension of that class is first order definable using the same parameter that you use to define the class in the first place. So in other words, my assignment of extension objects to classes is going to have the property that you can recognize when a particular object is the extension object of that class uh, in a first order manner. That's what this is saying. And furthermore, if you have a whole bunch of classes indexed by a definable class and you have a sort of definable Association. So for lots of different little i's, you have classes. Uh, you can think of it defining a sort of two dimensional class, and we're talking about the sections of that class. So the whole thing is definable. Uh, then the function that maps every little i to the extension of that section is first order definable for the association that I'm going to provide. Okay, and then in the general case, if you abandon Bloss and Kanamori and you go to Gödel Bernays set theory where now classes are actual objects. So in the Gödel Bernays set theory, in any model of ZF where, the, where we take as classes all and only the definable classes, then the full mapping is second order definable in that context. So we can, we can recognize uh, which objects are the extensions of a class and which classes are assigned to which objects that will be expressible in the second order language. Okay, and then finally, the assignment has the property that basic law five is fulfilled. Okay, so this is the sense in which we're getting basic law five as a consequence of CF uh, in a definable manner. So, okay, I wanna talk about the proof of this. It's not, it's not terribly difficult, um, but to start, I need to tell you what are the extension objects that I'm uh, going to assign to the classes. 
So suppose that we have some class F and it's been presented to us intentionally. So we have the formula and we have the parameter presented to us. Um, then when I, uh, right, so we've, we have the formula. <clears throat> now, of course, we, one would naturally want to take as the extension object the class X, uh, of all the Xs that fulfill it itself. That, of course, doesn't work because that might not be a set. That's the whole problem. We need to pick some other objects that's going to be the extension, okay? And this is the sense in which does the extension of a concept have to be the class of instances fulfilling that concept? And basic law five doesn't say anything about that. It just has to be an object that is an invariant for that equivalence relation. And so uh, in general, we can't use this class as, a, as the extension of the concept because it might not be a set, but it has to be a set because that's what we're trying to do is assign to every class F uh, an object, which we're calling the extension of that class. Okay, so we have to do something else. And what we're gonna do is use the data of the presentation itself in order to define what the extension of F is. So given a definable class, presented intentionally, meaning that we have the formula and we have the parameter, then I can consult a fixed enumeration of formulas. So in the meta theory, there's an enumeration of all the formulas and the, the object theory agrees on the standard initial segments of that enumeration. And I let C be the earliest formula in that enumeration such that there's some parameter P that happens to define the same class as phi does. We have phi, so we can look for the earliest formula that could possibly be equivalent to it. And then uh, for that formula, maybe there's a choice of parameters and you might think, oh, well, if you're gonna pick the smallest formula that defines that class, you need to also pick a parameter that's gonna work with that definition. And that's gonna axiom of choice, but I'm talking about ZF. I'm not using any axiom of choice at all. And instead, I'm going to use something like Scott's trick. Namely, I'm going to take the set of all such parameters of minimal rank that happen to work with that formula C in order to define a class that's equivalent to my original concept F. Okay, so I'm given F and I'm given phi and Z explicitly. And then I'm gonna look for the smallest C that could possibly define an equivalent class. And I'm gonna look at the set of all minimal rank parameters that work with that formula. And U is, is the set of all such parameters. And then I, de I define the, the extension of F is that pair. It's the minimal formula and the set of minimal rank parameters that work with that formula. So in short, the extension of a concept is the smallest formula capable of defining it with some parameter together with a set of minimal rank parameters that do so. Now, okay, maybe someone is worried. Maybe the worry is that I'm using a truth predicate or something which of course is not definable because I'm talking about truth of these formulas and so on. And, and this dancing around the truth predicate is exactly the reason for the very careful way I stated the definability conditions in the theorem. We don't need a truth predicate, in fact. And the definability uh, uh, properties I'm achieving for the uh, extension of the class um, were stated precisely in a way to uh, uh, get around the need for a um, truth predicate. Okay, so first let's let's establish the definability. So given a, given a class presented intentionally that is with the formula and parameter given to us, then there's only finitely many preceding formulas on the list. And so to express the property y equal extension of f, we can just take a disjunction over those finitely many, and that's a meta theoretically finitely many. Uh, uh, formulas uh, asserting that y is this pair um, uh, and, and that phi i, so u is the set of minimal parameters that with phi i define it and there's no earlier one that works. So this property is expressible in the language of set theory. I don't need to reach into second order or anything. I can just say that uh, I've got the right one. Okay, so the key point is that phi is given and it is standard finite. And so this is an actually finite list. And so I can make the formula asserting uh, that, that the particular formula is or is not 
the earliest one, because I know that the, the earliest one that's going to work is going to be uh, appearing at the latest by phi, because phi itself works to define the class that phi defined. Um, and so the, the earliest form is going to be either phi or some earlier one, and I can express whether y is, uh, uh, is equal to that data or not. Okay, so we don't need a truth predicate or the axiom of choice to do this. Okay, now for this second claim about the uniform function, so if I have a function, a class function giving me a lot of classes, then I want to argue that there's a class function that gives me the extensions of those classes. Um, but if if I have the uniform defined, if I if I have a uniform definition of the class as f sub i, then this i is basically just another parameter in the definition. And so it's a consequence of the first part, namely the, the formula asserting y equal extension of fi is defined by that first order property because there's only finitely many earlier formulas that could possibly work with some parameter. Um, and so it's basically the same argument. Okay, so this gives a uniform definition of this class function that maps any i to the extension of the ith concept. And that definition is first order expressible in the language of set theory. Okay, so thus, whenever we have a concept for a function from objects to concepts, then we also have a concept for the extensions of those concepts. That's what we've got so far. Okay, then finally, the third definability claim that I made was that if we don't have F given intentionally, but we only have F in the sense of, say, Gerlo Bernays set theory, where uh, it's just a, a class object, but we don't know which particular formula it is that defines it, then it's, uh, it's too much to ask for us to get the extension of that concept in a first order way, because we're gonna really be needing a truth predicate in order to do that. But the point is that because we're given that F is, is first order definable by some formula, we know that we only ever need to appeal to some sigma n truth predicate for formulas up to complexity sigma n. And those are definable for every standard n, and that's going to be good enough. And so we can, uh, for standard n, we can define the sigma n truth predicates. And so they exist as classes in that model because I equipped the model with all the definable classes. So in particular, we have these partial truth predicates there. And therefore we can express what is what it means in general for y to be the extension of f in a second order way where we're quantifying over these partial truth predicates that are themselves also first order definable. Okay. So, uh, um, right. So the complexity is actually delta one one because well, we're saying for every class T that's a sigma and truth predicate, but it, it's unique. So we could have said there is a class T. So the complexity is sort of, it's second order, but it's very low in complexity in the second order hierarchy. Okay, so finally, I wanna prove that basic law five holds for this definition, right? We defined what the extensions are, right? The extension of a definable class is basically the smallest formula and the set of minimal rank parameters that would define that class. That's the extension. And this obviously satisfies basic law five because if you know, if you know the extension of the concept, you can recover the concept and, and it, it depended only on the extension. Uh, I mean, on the, what we now call the, the class, it depended only on the course of values of the concept. And so therefore it's going to be invariant. If you have two different concepts that have the same course of values, then, uh, then they're gonna have the same minimal formula that works to define them because that formula is just defining that course of values basically. So that's gonna give us basic law five. Okay, so I wanna talk a briefly about some previous results that were, are tending in this direction, namely, Terence Parsons proved in 1987 um, the consistency of the first order fragment of Frege's system by a cardinality argument. So it's a very general argument showing that um, you, know, you can always assign extension objects to definable classes, I mean, to uh, 
um, uh, if you're if you're just in the first order fragment, you can augment the language with these extension operators in such a way uh, to fulfill basic law five. And and the argument is basically. If, if you have a countable domain, you divide that countable domain into countably many countably infinite sets. And then you use the objects in the first layer to be the extension objects of the definable classes just in the base language without referring to extensions. And then you use the objects in the second layer to be the extension objects of the concepts that are expressible in terms of the extension objects that you had already defined and, and, then, and, and so forth. And so in this way, you are basically defining the extension objects by rank on the extension depth of the formulas that you're talking about and uh, on the depth of the definitions and the extensions that they're used. Okay, it's a very general argument. Uh, Bell, John Bell, uh, strengthened the results, and he has a nice way of doing it, uh, a kind of model theoretic way, um, namely, uh, what he wants is for every formula A, there's a constant in the language such that those constants obey the analog of basic law five. It's a different, maybe, I mean, it's, it's not that different, but it's, I think a helpful way, a, a model theoretic way of understanding what's at stake in the basic law five situation. So if you have a model theoretic language, a first order language, then you can fulfill basic law five if you have constants in the language in such a way that you can associate to every formula such a constant and make this equivalence true. That's what basic law five is amounting to. Um, so John Burgess carries out Parsons' argument a little bit more explicitly, and he's using compactness to achieve consistency in the expanded language. He expands the language and adds uh, these extension objects in and the basic law five property, and then appeals to compactness to get consistency that way. And then uh, a bit later, he mounted a similar argument using Lovenheim's Skolem. So he looked at the sort of second order version the, in the Hankin semantics and used the Lovenheim Skolem argument to reduce from the full second order semantics to a countable Hankin semantics and then appeals to this sort of countable, countable domain, countably many classes to assign the, um, the extension objects. Okay. So, so why did I bother? Because we already have basic law five in all these different ways. And so I wanna highlight the way in which my proposal is different from these previous ones. Um, and these prior arguments in effect specify the value of the extension from outside. Yeah, we have this countable domain and then we have the definable classes and they're both countable. And so we match them up and, and assign the value. So there's absolutely no definability uh, they're not. They're not getting any definability for the for the uh, assignment of the uh, classes to the extension objects. Um, so even when, for example, we might have a very specific concept f at hand, but in those accounts we can't recognize what the extension object is. In fact, it could be anything because we could have divided up our domain totally differently in a totally non-definable way. Um, and, uh, and so we're not getting any, uh, any definability of the extension objects. Okay, so the labeling is performed from outside as though by the hand of God. I mean, it's like someone's looking down on the model and saying, well, here's a concept, I'm gonna give it this object and that's a different concept, I'm gonna give it this object and so on. That's how the proofs go. And so um, uh, it's very different from my way of proceeding because uh, my account is deflationist in the sense that uh, I'm defining the extension in the language of set theory. And so I'm not assigning the extensions from outside the model, it's all from inside the model. And the model itself can tell what is the extension object for this class and that class and are they equal or not. And, and these are all um, provable properties about the objects inside the model. Okay. Let me say also that I find it a little strange to neglect the identity criteria and the definability questions, because of course, Frege is using that all over the place. Uh, he wants to go from a concept to the extension in a very general way. For example, when he's defining the natural numbers, right? A natural number is an object that has 
every property that holds a zero and is always transferred from an object to its successor. And so he's using uh, in a very general way, I think all over the place, this uh, identity criteria and the definability properties for the extension objects. Okay, so the questions are how, how do the extension objects get assigned to the concepts and how can we recognize uh, whether a given object uh, is the extension of a particular concept and how do we recognize whether a given object uh, is the extension of some concepts, right? This is sort of like uh, the, the Julius Caesar problem here arising for basic law five, right? How can we recognize whether an object is, is an extension of a concept? Okay. So, um, right. In a sense, what, what use is the extension assignment solution if it's totally external? It seems like we can't use it. If we wanna be inside the model, we can't use that extension without going and talking to, uh, to whoever made the assignments for us. Uh, and so, um, Okay, so I find it strange to neglect those aspects of the basic law five problem. Okay, so let's now move to um, uh, how do we reconcile with the Russell paradox? So the apparent consistency of basic law five with Russell's reputation. So Russell's argument is most naturally construed as the reputation of general comprehension, as we said, of course, the argument itself is refuting the idea that you can always form a set from any property and of course, the argument refutes even very simple instances of this just with the property X not in X. Um, <clears throat> but the historical difficulty is that Frege doesn't state general comprehension explicitly. He has basic law five, but he doesn't state general comprehension. Um, and uh, it's sort of hidden away, I think, uh, into his manner of forming concepts and denoting them and his use of basic law five. Um, so this is why both Russell and Frege describe, uh, or this is why I take it that both Russell and Frege describe Russell's argument as refuting basic law five. Um, uh, so this is a quote that, uh, that Patty Blanchett, and uh, thank you for being here, um, uh, uh, pointed out to me, namely, uh, this is in response to Russell's letter, Frege says, um, okay, so he says my law five is false and my explanations do not suffice to secure a meaning for my combinations of signs in all cases. So it seems like uh, maybe there's an implicit commitment to general comprehension, um, uh, even if it isn't explicit. So, right. Okay, so how do we refute basic law five explicitly using Russell, Russell's argument? <clears throat> we can't use general comprehension. I just wanna aim it at basic law five. And what we seem to need is this concept X does not fall under any concept of which X is the extension. That's the analog of X being non self membered. We need this <clears throat> X does not fall under any concept of which X is the extension. So if we have that as a concept, let's call it R, then we can let little r be the extension of that concept. And by basic law five, any concept of which little r is the extension will agree with that concept in, in predication. And so little r falls under r if and only if it doesn't. And that's the Russell paradox. Okay, so it's not just basic law five, but this concept existence assertion. We need some kind of comprehension like X that's telling us that certain kinds of concepts exist. And specifically, this is the one that we need, that we seem to need. So the main point, is that we need these concept formation principles, which can be seen as an instance of class comprehension. Um, <clears throat> it would suffice if we had the falling under concept, because if, if, we, if we had the concept of object X falls under the concepts of which Y is the extension, then we could form this concept and we could run the contradiction. We could run the Russell argument and get the contradiction. But this falling under concept is a basically a truth predicate, isn't it? I mean, the, the relation X falls under the concepts of which Y is the extension is, is a truth predicate. And uh, Frege is using it all over the place, uh, this falling under relation, I think. <clears throat> I mean, even in the definition of natural number, like I just defined before. Um, okay, so, 
because it's a truth predicate, it, it, it suggests thinking about Tarski's theorem. So Tarski proved the non-definability of truth. In Zermelo Franco set theory and also arithmetic and so on in a very general way, first order truth is not first order definable. There's no formula T, which is going to hold of a formula parameter if and only if that formula is true at that parameter for every formula. Okay. What I want to do is give a proof of this. Usually when you see a proof of Tarski's theorem, it's doing using Gödel's fixed point lemma and you, you form the sentence that asserts its own non-truth and then you appeal to the liar paradox logic and get a contradiction. Um, <clears throat> but I want to give a proof directly from Russell. Okay, and the proof is using such a truth predicate, we could express the falling under concept. If we had a truth predicate, in my extension definition, we could express the falling under concept. And therefore, uh, uh, it would contradict the Russell theorem that we proved before. <clears throat> okay, so, so the Russell paradox becomes a proof of Tarski's theorem on the non-definability of truth. And I want to point out that this is very similar kind of reasoning to what Mel Fitting does in the paper that Volker and I had read in our uh, film math, in the grad film math seminar last term. Um, so it's not exactly what Fitting does um, because he's not talking about Frege really there at all, um, but it's a uh, kind of parallel argument. Um, okay, so the Fregean slogan might be truth is not a concept. Uh, this is really what this is showing. Uh, so we should interpret the Russell argument as, as ruling out this predicate, that's truth is not a concept, that's the real conclusion of the Russell argument, the way I see it. Okay, so we, we proved the non-definability of truth using uh, the Russell paradox, uh, and it completely sidesteps the fixed point lemma. We didn't need the fixed point lemma at all to do it. Uh, we're just using the Russell argument directly. Um, and because Tarski's theorem leads immediately to Gödel's theorem, uh, you, we can look on the Russell argument as a direct proof of the incompleteness theorem of Gödel without using the fixed point lemma or Gödel's proof. Um, and uh, okay, this line of argument is similar to how Fitting argued in 2017, but also and Raymond Raymond, I think, really emphasized this point that much of the fascination nation and uh, celebration around Gödel's theorem maybe is more uh, uh, appropriately directed at Tarski's theorem. Uh, because Gödel's theorem, of course, is an immediate consequence of Tarski's theorem. If you know that truth is not default, and you, but, but we know that proof is definable, then they can't be the same thing, which is another way of stating the incompleteness theorem. Okay, so Russell's argument shows that truth is not a concept, but for a given concept, phi, of course, we can express x falls under phi because that's what phi is doing. And so it's not true that we, we can't ever express the falling under relation. For a specific concept, we can express the, the falling under that concept. What we can't do uh, is have a uniform account. x falls under the concept of which y is the extension. That's the uniform one. And that's what we can't have uh, as a concept. Okay, so it's similar instance. Of course, Tarski's theorem isn't saying that you can't ever say a statement is true. I mean, of course, the statement itself expresses its own truth, right? The, the Tar Tarski's theorem is about the sort of having a uniform account that's working with all formulas uh, at once. And it's very similar uh, to what's going on here. Okay, so let me now move the a very similar idea applies to other Fragian abstraction principles. So let's talk about the Cantor-Hume principle, uh, which is often called the Hume principle. So one class X is equinumerous with another if there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. And the number assignment problem is the problem of assigning another object to a, a class X in such a way that it is a, an invariant for the equinumerosity relation. And that is exactly what the Cantor-Hume principle expresses. The number of x's is the same as the number of y's, just in case x and y are equinumerous. Okay, so now I want to prove the analog 
of the Kanner Hume principle using similar ideas. Okay, so there's a number assignment scheme assigning to every definable class the number of that class which fulfills the Cantor Hume principle. Okay, now this is considerably easier if we're not doing it for classes but only for sets. If we only want to talk about the number of a set, then and it's even, even easier if we have the axiom of choice. So here I have ZFC. So if we want to do it first in ZFC, then of course this is just the smallest ordinal that's bijective with the, with the set. So the cardinality of a set is the smallest ordinal that is bijective with it. And that is a solution of the number assignment problem for sets, for classes that are sets using the axiom of choice. But in fact, uh, that is stronger than the Kanner Hume principle because that solution is not just finding an invariant for the equinumerosity relation, it's picking a represented from each equinumerosity class. You know, it's a much stronger requirement. So it's, if you define the cardinality of a set to be the smallest ordinal that's bijective with it, then in particular, the cardinality of a set is bijective with the set. So you've selected a member of the class as the invariant. But the Hume principle doesn't require that. It doesn't require that the number of F is one of the sets that's equinumerous with F. It just has to satisfy this equivalence. Um, and if you, if you give up that requirement, I mean, if, if we just want to get the Hume principle itself, then we don't need the axiom of choice. So in fact, we can use Scott's trick. So for any set X, we can define the number of X to be the set of all rank minimal sets that uh, in the equinumerosity class of X. So we have, we have the cumulative set theoretic hierarchy, this V it's building up. Yeah, we're adding more and more sets as we go. Then for any given set, some first stage where we get some sets that happen to be equinumerous with X. And I don't have to pick one. I'm just going to take the set of all of the first appearing sets. That's the, that's the essence of Scott's trick. So we're picking a subset of the equinumerosity class. And by the way, I had a conversation with Dana Scott recently because uh, we were exchanging some emails about another matter. And I told him, oh, I'm, I'm mentioning your trick in this paper I'm writing. And, uh, and, and uh, I can tell you his response. It was a little... It was a little disappointing, I have to say. But he told me how it happened. Namely, he was a student, an undergraduate student in Berkeley, taking a class from Tarski, Alfred Tarski. And Tarski was talking about uh, to, find a, to find an invariant. You don't need to pick a member. In fact, it would suffice to pick a subset of the, of the equivalence class in question. Scott said, well, why don't we just define the minimal rank set? Uh, and that works in general for any equivalence relation. You can always take this collection of minimal rank instances, and you don't need any axiom of choice to get that. And so he did that sitting in the, sitting in Tarski's class. And Tarski, I guess, was writing a paper and credited the idea to Scott. Um, but Scott really doesn't want to be remembered for Scott's trick. He told me quite explicitly that this is a very minor thing that he did when he was an undergrad and, and uh, it was something that uh, was possibly obvious in retrospect. I don't agree at all. I think it's a fantastic idea and it solves many, many problems and it keeps coming up in my own work again and again. I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, but Scott himself was uh, kind of disparaging of it and, uh, and, and mentioned a, a number of other uh, extremely important things that he had done that he would much rather be remembered for. So if you encounter Dana Scott, then you should mention one of those other things instead of Scott's trick. Okay, so this is an equinumerosity invariant and it fulfills the Kanner Hume principle for sets. So it's so in ZF, we can solve the number assignment problem for sets, the Kanner Hume principle for sets. But Kanner Hume isn't about sets, it's really about classes. We need to find a number assignment problem that's gonna work for arbitrary classes, not just sets. Um, even though Frege was concerned particularly with finite numbers, I mean, he was trying to, to get a, a theory of finite uh, arithmetic uh, in logic and so on and interested in the, in the Kanner-Hume principle because of the finite ones and those will all be sets. Nevertheless, uh, 
you can't tell whether a class is a finite set or a set or not. This is not uh, uh, so easy to, to, to do. And so um, we really want to make the cardinal assignment problems for classes, not the sets. OK, if we have global choice, which is the principle that says there's a well ordering of the universe of all sets, making it uh, in bijection with the ordinals, then we have a uniform way of picking a minimal representative from any equivalence class, but also all proper classes will be bijective with one another. And so there's only one more cardinality, namely the proper class cardinality in that case. And so we're gonna get a solution. We can assign uh, the number of Fs is either the smallest ordinal equinumerous with F if, it, if it's a set uh, or some other default value that's going to be uh, representing the proper classes. Okay, that's gonna work when you have global choice because then all the proper classes have the same equinumerosity class. Um, but if global choice fails, then you can have many different class cardinalities, it turns out. Uh, you must because the ordinals won't be equinumerous with all of V because to say that V and ORD are equinumerous is exactly to assert the global choice principle. So if global choice fails, then there will be more than one cardinality for the proper classes. Uh, so let me explain how to solve the number assignment problem in the, in the general case. Okay, so the main difficulty is that we can have different proper classes which are not equinumerous, but we need still to associate each of them with a number. Uh, but we can do the same kind of trick that I did for basic law five. For any definable class F, we're gonna assign the number of F. Um, if the class is given intentionally, then it's going to be um, a second order expressible. We shouldn't be surprised that it's second order now because the equinumerosity relation itself on classes is a second order property, right? To say that two classes are equinumerous is to assert the existence of a class one-to-one -one correspondence between them. That's a second order assertion. So it's different from basic law five. The equivalence of concepts in basic law five was a first order expressible equivalence, but for equinumerosity, it's a second order expressible equivalence. So we get a more complicated definability uh, um, criteria here. Okay, and the numbers are well defined. Uh, so this is saying we're satisfying the Cantor Hume principle. Okay, so, and then we can prove the Cantor Hume principle. Um, so given a, given a definable class, we let the number be the smallest formula and the smallest and the set of minimal rank parameters that work with that formula to define some class that's equinumerous with F. And this is going to be an invariant uh, for the same kind of reason that the basic law five invariant worked um, uh, before. Okay, so, um, right, okay, I said this already. So let's think about more general kinds of Frege and abstraction. I mean, Frege talks about the getting the direction of a line from the parallel relation. So lines are parallel and so on. We, the, the direction of the line is an invariant with respect to the parallel equivalence relation. Um, so suppose we have a first order definable equivalence relation on sets, then we want to define the abstraction of a set should be an invariant. It should, the abstraction of X should be equal to the abstraction of Y just in case X and Y are equivalent with respect to that equivalence relation. Um, so this is the easy case. Uh, if it lives on sets only, then we can just use Scott's trick. The abstraction of X can just be the set of minimal rank members of the equivalence class. And that will fulfill this abstraction requirement. Um, so the more difficult case is when you have an equivalence relation on classes instead of just on, uh, so suppose that you have some equation on concepts or classes, then, uh, uh, well, basic law five, of course, is, is an, uh, an instance of this. It's a first order expressible equivalence relation on concepts, because that's a first order quantifier here. Um, and we want to assign the abstraction objects so as to fulfill the Frege and abstraction equivalence. 
And uh, so the theorem again is in any such case, if you have a sort of definable occurrence relation on classes, then we can assign abstraction objects to the classes in such a way that we fill the abstraction equivalence requirement. Um, and, and again, for any particular definable class, the identity criteria for BAT abstraction is first order expressible. This is just like what we did in the basic law five case, but it works in general for any first order definable uh, case of Fragian abstraction. So, right. So maybe the argument is just basically the, the same as what we've been talking about. You take the smallest formula that defines class, some parameter that's equivalent to the given class, and then you take the set of all minimal rank parameters that work, and then you can recognize that and so on, just as before. So, uh, so that theorem is a, it's a general of the theorem I stated earlier. So it's basic law five as a special case. We don't get the Kanner Hume principle as a special case of that because that one was about first order equivalence, but a Kanner Hume principle is a second order equivalence relation. Okay. So what do you of equinumerosity if you only cared about Kanner Hume principle for sets instead of for classes, then it would become a first order equivalence relation again. Okay, let me conclude by mentioning, of course, for example, on finite arithmetic and there's a very natural context of finite set theory, namely zermelo franco without the axiom of infinity and with the negation of the axiom of infinity. Uh, and that's quite a nice realm for Fragan thinking. So the, the intended model here is the, the collection of hereditarily finite sets um, you, you should state the foundation axiom properly, not just with regularity, but with the epsilon induction scheme. And then it becomes bi-interpretable with piano arithmetic. Um, and every, basically everything that I said works in that finite realm almost identically and even better because uh, um, we get basic law five and we get the Fragian abstractions and so on in the context of hereditarily finite sets. But furthermore, Theory has basically global choice because all the sets are finite and we can uh, we have this natural number enumeration is the ordinals of that model. And so, so we're in the sort of global choice case. So all the proper classes in that model, those will be the countably infinite classes, will be equinumerate with one another. And so we're going to get this sort of um, the, the full counter Hume principle in the way that we had wanted. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, so um, we'll take a five minute break and then uh, resume for questions. Thanks very much. Let's see, Patty um, Blanchette uh, has a question. Thanks, Dan. Thanks very much, Joel. That was, that was really cool. So I had a quick question about the definability issue. I, I want to agree wholeheartedly that it is, it's really nice to see these extensions definable as opposed to, as you say, sort of being, being given by God. My, my only question was about your thought that for Frege definability was important or played some role. I mean, the picture I have is that for Frege extensions are things such that, you know, when you say that two extensions are identical, you're saying that the concepts associated with them are coextensive. And that's kind of the end of the story. Uh, the only time you really need to say anything more about extensions is if you've got discourse for them happening in some formal system in which you really need to make sure that every sentence gets a truth value. So then you get this weird stuff about identifying a couple of the extensions with um, truth values, just to you know sort of tidy things up. But so, but you mentioned um, for example, the definition of, um, of natural number in terms of zero and the ancestral of successor. And, and I thought you'd said that the definability of the extensions themselves was important there. And, and I just didn't quite see how, or maybe I misunderstood what you said. 
So could you just, just comment on that, please? Sure, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much for the question. So, so I, think you're, I think you're right. In that particular instance, what's important is that Frege is using the, the, the general uniform falling under relation. Yeah? So, yeah. so I would disagree with the, what you said in the beginning, namely that uh, when Frege is talking about extensions, then he's only using that look if the if two objects uh, are the extensions of the of two different if two concepts have this have a same extension, then they're coextensive with one another, and that's the end of it. That's not quite right because the falling under relation is going dramatically beyond that. I think he really needs the the generalized falling under relation, which is a truth predicate, basically. Uh, e even in his definition of natural number, which was the point I was trying to make. So you're right, it's not about defining that a particular object is the extension of say the number seven. I don't think that was important in his definition of number, but what was important in his definition of number was this ancestral property, which is using the generalized falling under, the uniform falling under relation, basically a truth predicate, right? Because he has to say, uh, X is a number if X has every property that uh, is is holding of zero and is propagated from a number to to its to its successor or from an object to its successor. But to say that it's propagated and so on, you're you're using this falling under in a very generalized way because he's saying for every property, in other words, for every object that might represent a concept, and then we need to refer to that concept holding. Uh, uh, and so I think he really is using that um, uh, that falling under concept. But yeah, I would, I mean, I would defer to you as to what exactly he's using about definability of the extension objects themselves. Maybe it wasn't so important. I mean, I guess in a sense, this all the discussion about Julius Caesar can be seen as uh, as about this definability. How do you recognize whether something is a is a extension of a concept at all, or is a number, right? It's just another instance. Um, so the, the basic law five, the, the, the concept extension version of the Julius Caesar problem is, is at its heart about the uh, definability criteria. You know, can we tell if something is an extension or can we tell if it's the extension of this concept rather than that one and so on and I guess, Frege was pointing out in his uh, remarks on the Julius Caesar problem for the for the Canon Hume principle that you can't tell, <laughs> right? So he, he didn't have definability, I guess. Right, he doesn't, um, and and so I and I think um, yeah, this would be a long a long discourse. I think that the I think there isn't such a thing as the as the Julius Caesar problem. Actually, I, I think these texts are widely misinterpreted. I think all he cares about <clears throat> really is that he's got objects. Pardon me. <clears throat> that that play the role they need to play to satisfy basic law five. Pardon me, <clears throat> but you're absolutely right. I mean, of, of course, I agree with you that you need these objects to to be really objects. They have to fall under concepts, and you have to make sense of talking about, for example, every concept under which this extension falls. Absolutely, it just um, isn't the case that one needs to define what the extensions are any more than a set theorist needs to define what sets are, aside from things that are sets and that make the axioms true. Kind of thing. Anyway, so so that was, but that helps me a lot. Now I, I think I understand better where the interest, um, well, I think the interest in definability is intrinsic, um, but I think I understand better now why you're linking the interest in definability with some of Frege's interests. So thank you. I see, thank you very much. And I would look forward to talking a lot more with you about- uh, I, I am looking forward to it myself. Okay. Good, thank you. Okay, Tim Williamson. Yeah, so so this, this is actually just um, in relation to what you've been saying about the, the falling under as, as, a, as a truth uh, concept. I mean, do, is what you're saying is, I mean, does it apply just to the falling under itself or to the falling under the concept of which Y is the extension? Because, you know, if you're, um, if you're really working in, in a, a second order or higher order language, um, you know, X falling under the concept 
C. It is just a, a kind of clunky um, natural language um, way. Once once we've sort of illicitly nominalized the the, the concept, you know, of doing uh, just ordinary um, predication, which you know, and and if as it were, if 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 you if C was a proper second order variable. So you just do it, you get it by just writing C, you know, C of X. And so when you've been talking about this, uh, something that's really a sort of um, a truth concept, I, I, I'm right in thinking that really what's, what you have in mind is the X falling under the concept of which Y is the extension thing as a whole, and not just the, the falling uh, under bit, which which seems like it by itself is is harmless and and doesn't give you anything like a truth predicate. Is is that how to understand what you've been saying? Yes, yeah, I think that's exactly right. I agree with everything you said. I mean, and I was trying to to hint at that when I was talking about this uniformity question. For any given assertion in the first order language of set theory, then we have a way of saying phi of x. You know, you just say phi of x holds, right? Or and so to assert any given instance of definability or falling under is no problem at all. What's difficult is when you want to do it uh, as a binary relation, X falling under the concept of which Y is the extension, that's the problematic one. And so when I was talking about the falling under concept, I meant that general uniform one, not just the instance where the concept is fixed. Yeah. And I think this distinction between uh, sort of, you know, an instance of uh, falling under versus the uniform account is really the essence. Of course, it, it comes up also in Tarski's theorem, right? We can we can define a truth predicate for any particular formula as a definably. We just assert phi of x. That's defining truth about whether phi of x is true or not. Phi of x itself does that, but that's not a truth predicate. Uh, that works for all formulas at the same time, that's the one that you can't have, right? And so that's the analog of this two-dimensional version X falling under the concept of which Y is the extension. That's like saying X is true for the formula that with girdle number N, you know, that's what you can't do. Um, and, and that's the sense in which I view this, this generalized falling under relation as, as amounting to a truth predicate. Yeah, could I just, but one sort of gloss on that. I mean, it's not just when, as a way, you have a a particular, uh, when you specify a particular concept, there's also, if you have, if you have second order um, predicate variables, I mean, the, 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 you, can, you can predicate them, um, you know, in the same completely harmless, way um and so you know it's um so it's as well you don't it's even if you don't have a fixed concept if you're just doing it in terms of the second order variables themselves there there isn't a problem it, it's only when you get to this more complicated thing which is bringing in extensions that you're getting the the problem yeah i agree with that i think that's totally right yeah, I mean, it's the problematic part of the falling under relation being not a concept is in the context of having basic law five, so that we have yes. this association of concepts with objects, which brings the the classes into the first realm of objects. I think you're totally right with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, Michael Prem, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, I have to unmute. Um, yeah, I, I have a question about Frege and the relationship of Frege to what you've been doing. Um, and it's connected up with this question of the falling under relation. But first, I'll just say this. Grungesetze is not a logic of concepts. It's a logic of functions. Um, and the basic law five is not a principle about concepts and their extensions. It's a principle about functions and their value ranges. Now, yes, concepts are um, functions of a certain kind, according to Frege. But th the reason I mention that is because when you said, well, the problem is if you have a general falling under relation, in a certain sense, Frege does, he defines it. That is, what he defines is functional application. Um, that is, he defines an operator such that if you give it the extension of a concept or the, the value range of a function and then another object, it will give you the value of applying the function to the object. 
right? He defines, that's the first thing he defines. Um, and that's what he uses all over the place. Now, in a certain sense, that is a falling under relation. That is to say, it effectively is that if the, the, the value of the function for, for the argument is a truth value. Um, but, but, but anyway, so he, he thinks he can define such a relation. And so, of course, he can produce Russell's par paradox. I mean, um, so, you know, it, I, I mean, I'm thinking this is connected up with your claim about, you know, um, sorry, comprehension being hidden in there somewhere. Um, but the way in which he thinks he can define, you know, what is effectively the falling under relation between, well, between not a concept and an object, but between, between the extension of a concept and the object um, gives you a way of formulating Russell's paradox. I mean, you can, or just look at the way he derives, he himself derives Russell's paradox from basic law five. And where in there is the comprehension axiom being hidden? Um, but anyway, that, that, so I know there's a question in there in a, in a sense, right? Um, but I'd just like you to say something about what I've said. <laughs> sure, yeah, that's completely fine. I mean, the, um, so you're describing what Frege is doing is the sort of what I would call functional application, right? So he's, right. he has a course of values and it's not just giving you truth values and then he wants to apply the function to an input and get the output value, right? But fall, the falling under relation is a special case of that, right? And, and this is already problematic, right? It doesn't seem like one has to really engage with the general functional application in order to find the problems because they're already there just with the falling under relation, my, which is my, a special case, right? Because they, right. My they point is he thinks have a he function can... that whose value range is always the two. Yeah, my, my point is he thinks he can define that. I didn't quite catch the Sorry, my point is he thinks he can define the falling under relation. Right, and so this is- And, go ahead. Yes, of course, yeah. Yeah, but, so, and so he has these implicit concept formation principles that en enable him to, uh, to get the existence of these concepts such as functional application or falling under and, and and it's those principles the way he doesn't state explicitly but uses implicitly that are the source, the genuine source of the problem. Because basic law five is not the problem because it's a theorem of ZF. How could it be, be wrong by itself? It isn't. It's provable in a very general well, context. I think the, the principles exist. Go ahead. Well, I, I mean, I take it this is just showing that what you're doing is totally non Fergian. I mean, the principles are principles of logic and they're not principles, they're, they're I mean, they're rules. <laughs> they're, not, they're not things that he would want to write down as formulas and add as premises. They are built into the way this, this, the, the notation is supposed to work. Um, they're more like the, the rules of inference or something. I mean, I just, I don't think what you're doing, I mean, there's a sense in which, yes, you're showing the consistency. I understand all the moves you made and you can do this within ZF, but I don't think Frego would say, oh, ZF is just what I was talking about. <laughs> okay, yeah, this is very much my no, object and concept. At all. I'm well, well, you talked about this as Fergian, oh, you're recapturing all these Fergian principles and so on. But I just think the framework is, is not Frego's, right. you know, would it be okay if I interjected a thought? <laughs> uh, so, so Michael, why not think that what goes on in uh, Frege's derivation of the contradiction <clears throat> that's really critically the use of a comprehension principle is, is the point at which he assumes the existence of the extension of that concept of what being the extension of a concept that you yourself don't fall under, right? So it's a, it's a fancy concept that he never thought about before Russell did. And it turns out it's got an extension. Why? Well, because his, as you say, it's it's just embedded in the notation, but his way of using the notation involves the assumption that for every open sentence, there's a concept or function, and for every function, there's an extension. And you put those two together and you get the 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 functor, right? The extension of. And I think if I'm right, that's what Joel's been sort of focusing on is a separation between 
just extensionality, namely basic law five, and this really um, uh, extreme version of comprehension that's in the background of Frege's use of notation. I hope that wasn't an unfair characterization, Joel. Now I will mute myself again. That's completely fine with me, but I wanted to also respond uh, to, to Michael Breckley. When I started my talk, I said that I'm not talking about Frege's system and I'm not looking at Frege from a set theoretic point of view. I'm trying to look at set theory with Fregean ideas in mind. And, and, and I do think that this, this way of thinking about the set theoretic universe as consisting of objects and the classes, the dependable classes being concepts, I think is a quite Fregean way of thinking about doing set theory. I'm not saying Frege would agree, yeah, that's his system. I don't think that he would, as, as you said, and I'm, I'm not claiming that at all. And I don't think that I did. I'm just trying to understand theory in it from a kind of Fregean like perspective and observing that we get basic law five and Fregean abstraction as theorems. And, and I find that a little interesting. Um, and also I think it, it, the, the idea that, uh, that the difficulties caused by the Russell paradox in effect have to do with this, uh, with this uniform falling under relation shows this deep connection with Tarski and the non-definability truth, which I also find interesting, but I'm not claiming that, uh, that Frege would say, yeah, this, this is his system. Okay. Uh, I mean, okay. that's fine. Okay. I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> we should go on to the next question, which is from Tim Button. Oh, hi, Joel. Uh, thanks very much. Um, my question was hey, about Tim. how this relates to, um, well, it was the stuff about uh, the connection with Tarski's indefinability theorem and avoiding the diagonalization lemma, because that sounds very nice. Um, I was just wondering about the, the possible virtues of still sometimes going via the diagonalization lemma. Um, so I was thinking about how your kinds of arguments generalize. Like if I want to show that second order truth isn't second order definable, um, it looks like I one easy way to do it is just look as I know how to do it from Tarski, uh, I'm not sure how I would uh, use your style of tactic. Um, so I was just wondering if there are there is a if there's a more general way of avoiding diagonaliz diagonalization lemma results in this vicinity. Like, what's the class of theories for which I can escape uh, having to use the Tarski diagonalization lemma and can get everything out of Russell? Right. Oh, I see. That's a good question. Okay. Well, I mean, specifically in terms of getting it to work for second order set theory, say, uh, I think it just works out of the box because, uh, I mean, if you're if you're going to do second order set theory and take the classes as objects, and then you want to look at second order expressivity over that, then it's basically now a first order theory. If you think about how Henkin semantics work there, even if you have the full model in mind. Uh, and one can take the smallest formula and so on and do the same kind of extension trick. Um, and, and I think it's just going to work exactly the same. And, and I, I explained how to get it down to finite set theory, which is by interpretable with arithmetic. And so it seems like uh, I would expect it to work quite generally for, for any yeah. efficient theory um, that can, yeah, that we need to have formulas, we need to talk about the formulas and we need a version of Scott's trick or something in, in yeah. order for the part to work. Um, Sorry, I should, have, I should have been more specific when I said second order, that was silly of me. I meant um, in predicative second order theories um, because then I can't get Hume's principle working in those kinds of contexts or basic law five. This relies on the, the predicativity of the system, right? Because as soon as I have an impredicative comprehension principle, uh, then I can do comprehension as regards the, well, the falling under concept that you just discussed, actually. It's, it's the impredicativity that allows me to derive the contradiction in basic law five. Well, so, okay, if, if we're going to do second order, if you want to move fully to second order, am I allowed to assign the second order objects as the extensions? 
I mean, that's how I was interpreting your question, but maybe that's not what you meant. You still want to have the first order objects as yes. the extensions of the concepts, but then it's clearly impossible just on yes. cardinality grounds. I mean, no, no, so... in, no, indeed. I mean, it's, um, so I'm just sort of, uh... <laughs> So the, the basic point was I had like a clear sense of like a class of theories for which this is okay and a clear sense of a class of theories for which I can't uh, do this kind of thing. Um, for me, though, the only dividing line I have is impredicative versus predicative comprehension. And I wonder if there's anything more fine grained that you've, you've found along the way, basically. So, you know, for what class of theories can I do something like this and then avoid? No, I haven't really thought about that. Okay. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> Right. Okay. Um, I guess oh, sorry, one, on. one, let me, I can say one more thing, which is that, uh, I mean, I, I proved the theorem in ZF. So we get all extensions of ZF, large cardinals, whatever you want. I mean, there's a lot of quite interesting and commonly considered theories that extend ZFC. I mean, that extends ZF and, and my theorem works in, in all of them, right? And, and th this includes theories that are normally described of as impredicative, I mean, ZF itself. Sure. Uh, so I would need to talk to you more closely about what this distinction, uh, the, the way that you're seeing it connected with this. Oh, I mean, it, sh it should work. With... I don't really know that, um, but uh... it, it should work for lots of theories which are much, much weaker than ZF, right? I mean, all you need is that you can, uh, you've got infinitely yeah. many objects, so we can do the syntax and we've got Scott's trick. So, um, you know, uh, right. that, that so, doesn't need replacement. So... Exactly. just needs a ranking operation um but yeah right. i mean exactly cool yeah i think i expect it to be extremely general i mean for zfc minus it's going to work or yeah. i haven't ever thought about scott potter set theory which i know you like um, <laughs> it'll, it'll work uh, there for sure so long but, as you have an axiom of infinity yeah 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 because yeah, you can still do scott's trick there yeah. and so uh, i think there's probably not much problem with that yeah. um Right, okay, question from Ian Rumford. Hello, Ian? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, yes uh, sorry, it took me a while to unmute. Um, yeah, yes, so, so I've got a sort of irenic suggestion, I think, but, but then a, a question which, which puzzles me more. Um, so so um, I wonder how what you've said relates to Frege's own discussion of the difficulty of talking about concepts in, in, in the famous paper on the concept horse. Um, now, um, I, I think what most people take from that um, is that if you really are talking about concepts, um, it's a fundamental mistake to think there's a relation between an object and a concept that falls under it. Um, you know, he talks about de blossa copula and, and, and the, the mistake of thinking that the copula of, you know, that we find in grass is green expresses any kind of relation. Um, but of course, what, what there is going to be um, is a, a relation, a, indeed a, a first order relation between an object and the extension of a concept under which uh, it might fall. Um, and um, I, 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 it seemed to me perhaps that, that, that some of the um, snares that, that were confusing the discussion earlier or a manifestation of this difficulty of talking about, about concepts without, as it were, being forced to think of them as, as objects. Um, and of course, in the Grundlagen, he does say that often when we talk about concepts as objects, what we mean to refer to is precisely their extension. Um, so so uh, that was, that's the irenic um, suggestion. Um, the, the, the question really is, is about the, um, uh, connection between this and and some notion of truth, uh, and this is what I'm not seeing. Um, so, so, when you look at the way that he um, does derive the Russell paradox in the appendix to the Grundgesetz uh, Volume Two, um, yes, uh, there's certainly uh, some sort of comprehension assumption smuggled in there, because uh, as, as Paddy says, he he. Um, for the argument to go through, he needs there to be an extension of that, of the Russell concept, if one likes to put it that way. Um, but when one's talking about truth, um, I, I take it you are talking in some way about um, properties of 
some sort of thing which represents something. Um, you know, whether it's a sentence or um, an assertion or, or, or something. And, 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 and what I'm not seeing in the way that he expounds Russell Paradox in the appendix is, is any reference to anything which involves representation. It seems to me that all we've got there is second order quantification over concepts, and indeed an assumption that, that concepts of the relevant kind have an extension. Um, but nothing involving any anything anything this looks to me like a something which where you could sensibly say it's true um so, so would you like to address that point sure yeah very good question thank you uh and uh, of course my slogan of truth is not a concept was meant to recall this horse example yeah. that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um right so I really would like to hear from the Frege experts here about whether Frege conceived of the extension of a concept as a collection in the way that I think is quite commonly done nowadays. Uh, um, and so people are shaking their heads. So maybe that's not true. And I and I and I thought that was the case. And that's why Basic Law Five is stated that way. So the way I understand it is the extension of a concept is an object that is representing that concept. It's a sort of stand-in for the concept. Um, but really we wanna use these extensions to represent the concept precisely because we want to assert the, the instances of falling under of those concepts, isn't it? And that's why I see it as connected with truth. Because to say, of course, that X falls under uh, a concept is, you know, that's a kind of instance of a truth assertion, except that he needs it in this very general way. X falls under the concept of which Y is the extension, where, where X and Y are first order variables representing objects. Yes. Um, and well, so, I don't, I don't think there's a uniform view among Frege scholars about, about this matter. I, I mean, I, I think that's fundamentally mistaken, you know, as a, as a reading of Frege. Um, uh, the idea that that extensions are represented. Okay, good. So that's yeah. what I thought. So, yeah. Um, so, but but but. Um, well, you're saying the yeah. view of thinking of extensions as collections is is well, not. There are two two, two, two things. I think that's doubtful. Point one. Okay. Uh, whether good. whether they are anything like um, uh, a set in the you know the Boulos lasso sense of a set where you you put right. a put a. Um, where you put a, um, uh, a lasso around an object, in, uh, a set of objects in thought, you know the stuff in, in yeah, the yeah. reference. Right, right, right. I don't think he thinks of it like that at all, um, but, but that's, a, you know, that, that, that's a contested matter. But, but it seems to me um, a less controversial matter would, would be even that, I, I think it's fairly clear he doesn't think of these things as representatives in, 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 in anything like the way that a sentence is representative. I think a sentence is the paradigm of a truth bearer. And, and I, I don't think that even if these extensions are thought of as collections of some kind, I don't think he thinks of them as representing anything in the way that a sentence represents something. Um, so, so, so there are sort of two steps there. Um, but, uh, and I, I think that most Frege scholars would certainly agree with me on the second point, even if they didn't agree with me on the first. I see, that's quite interesting. I thought he used, I mean, the translations I've seen use this word represent, the extension represents the concept is, so I'm not sure exactly mm -hmm. what sense Frege. Well, in, in, yeah, I, I think there's passages of more where he's talking about um, simply the business of bringing, bringing it down a level in the logic. Mm -hmm. It's a representative in that sense. Um, so, 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 you know, what, what he's um, often trying to do, and of course this is where it all goes wrong, is is to um, you know bring down the logical level of the discussion um, by a step, um, and um, it's it's in that sense that that uh, the, the extensions represent the concepts. But I don't think that that sense is particularly close to, to the sense in which you could say that a sentence represents the way things are. And that surely is. Oh, the, I see. Is, yeah, uh, and that surely is, 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 is what, what drives the idea of truth here. You know. Um, Mm -hmm. that, that's the worry, yeah. Right, okay. So this idea of bringing it down a level is, of course, extremely important for Frege. I mean, this is the whole mm -hmm. idea behind Basic Law 5. Yes. Is to Indeed. Use the objects as proxies for the concepts, right? And then when one is talking about the falling under, one that's is just talking about a relation between objects, that's not between right. objects and yes. concepts. 
Yeah. yeah. And, and so I, when I'm talking about truth, I'm not talking about truth in the external world or something like that. I'm just talking about whether, whether X falls under the concept F. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, no, I, 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 that's what I meant by truth. Yes, good. good. Frege is using yes. this concept of truth all over the place because he's yes. quantifying, he has second order quantifiers and then he's invoking the extensions of those concepts and then talking about uh, his given object falling under, even in the definition of what it means to be a natural number. This is, this is extremely important. And so it seems to me central, this, this, uh, this use of the, uh, of, of what I'm thinking of as basically a truth predicate or the falling under, the generalized falling under relation, it really seems to be pervasive in Frege's use as far as my reading. And, yeah, no, I, I, and I don't, really, yeah, I'm not trying really to like, say like, that yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. representing the concrete number. Yeah, so sorry, the, 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 the audio is cutting out a moment, but if, if, that, if that's all you mean by truth, I, I do see the force of what you're saying. Yeah, that was helpful. Th thanks, thanks. Okay, um, so it's a rather, I think it's rather to, well, a peripheral point really that you made in passing, but um, you were extolling the virtues of the understanding of um, the, um, the use of Tarski's theorem uh, for what it could uh, tell us about all sorts of things, and you, in particular, cited the fact that you can get girdles in completeness from Tarski. Uh, but I mean, just the obvious point that uh, it doesn't give you any particular sentence that's undecidable or particularly unprovable from the given system. You know that truth does not coincide with provability, but that doesn't tell you an instance where uh, you have a true sentence that's not uh, provable. Oh, I see. That's an extremely interesting question. Um, uh, I bet you could make one because it's a diagonal argument and these arguments are generally constructive. I mean, that, that kind of question is very similar to an issue that I often talk about in the context of Cantor's proof of the existence of transcendental numbers, right? So yes, well, that's a very does common give, version of the argument. No, no, that does give you a, a particular transcendental. I mean, that, that is right, know, exactly. Wrong. So can't we do the same thing here? Uh, I don't see how. I mean, yeah, I want to think more about that. I'm not going to be able to do it off the cuff, but because <laughs> Russell's argument is a diagonal argument, just like Cantor's. I would think that it's it is going to produce a specific sentence, uh, uh, but I need to think more about it. Yeah, uh, okay. that's well, a very interesting very question. Yeah, have that point made uh, analogously to making that point about Cantor. Which right, is, that's uh, a very uh, interesting point. Uh, yeah, I want to think more about that. Oh, great! Well, be great to hear the answer. Okay, thanks. This is this is just a little one ab about. Um, the, the, the last section on Fragian abstraction. Um, so you so you were getting that for um, you know when we were talking about sets and classes. But you know if you take something like Frege's uh, abstraction of directions from lines, I mean he's probably not thinking of lines as as sets or um, or classes and. Um, you know, and so the, the, there's, you know, the, I mean, he may be, he might even be thinking of of lines as um, something which are spatial and you know, in in a, um, a not merely mathematical <laughs> sense. And um, I mean, so you know, I was thinking about to how far you can you can extend your approach to that because we don't we don't have Scots trick for for lines I mean it might I mean people I mean it's controversial but people quite you know when they're dealing with I mean it seems like uh, you know a better setting would be ZF but with our elements and and then sometimes people assume that they um that there is a set of all the R elements although I'm not uh, you know how well motivated that would be in this setting I don't know so I would just wonder if you have any thoughts about extending it to that more general setting <laughs> 
Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, I would to extend to Ur elements would be a very natural case. To extend it to sort of Frege's system, then I don't. I wouldn't know how to proceed with that because I don't really know exactly what the theory is uh, uh, that one would have, and what are the kinds of objects that we would want if we have, you know, lines and also uh, all the other kinds of things that he was talking about. Um, and so, uh, so I wouldn't have much to say about that, but extending it to other kinds of set theory in particular with Ur elements, I think is quite an interesting thing. So if you have even a proper class of Ur elements and you have, uh, and they can be well-ordered, um, which is a common axiom to use, uh, then, uh, then you can still do Scott's trick and because you have a kind of hierarchy, the universe is a union. But actually there's a student uh, that I'm working with at Notre Dame now, um, uh, Bokai Yao, who has some work on uh, Kelly Moore's set theory with huge numbers of error elements, more than V many. So they, they're not just a proper class, but more than that. And, and it's really quite remarkable there. And so then Scott's trick is gonna fail uh, quite badly. And so it would be an open question, I guess, to what extent can you get basic law five in that setup? And I haven't, I haven't thought about that yet, but now that you have mentioned it, I think I'm gonna give it some thought um, or maybe encourage Yao to think about it. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so I think it's quite interesting to look, I guess that's sort of similar to the question that was asked earlier, namely uh, Tim's question about which, which other theories does it apply to? Um, and and I'm not quite sure, does one want to go to stronger and stronger theories or is it better to get something for weaker and weaker theories? And uh, it's uh, sort of two different approaches and I'm not quite sure which way is going to be the most fruitful to move in. Thanks. Hey, okay, so um, I don't know. Yes, there is time. Uh, that, is that Tim? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, so um, th there's, a, there's, a, there's a different way of thinking about that Morse-Kelly thing you just mentioned though, which um, would enable you to regard it as a much weaker theory. Obviously Morse-Kelly is in incredibly, incredibly strong. But if you instead just think about um, uh, a Scott Potter style set theory with Ur elements. Now, standardly you say the Ur elements form a set, but if you delete that, then you've got a weakening so if you just make no assumptions whatsoever about what the Ur elements no, 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 are, but... you've got a very weak theory oh, in I see. a sense. So you, I think you could you could regard this as finding it for, for weaker theories. Um, well, in a I, sense, I, I, having, having Ur elements is itself a weakening of ZF. Yeah, exactly. You're just weakening extensionality, but only for the empty sets, because yeah. an Ur element is basically another empty set. And, and, and if you give up extensionality, but only for empty sets, then that's amounting to having Ur elements. Yep. The interesting thing about Yao's situation is that he has, not only do the Ur elements not form a set, but they positively mm -hmm. form a huge class that's not bijective even with all the yeah. Yeah. pure sets. So it's a different kind of case, I think. And you, well, I mean, as it happens, and I should definitely talk to you about this now, um, you can reformulate the Scott Potter stuff without uh, having the assumption that, well, making any assumptions about the, uh, the cardinality of the Ur elements. So you could add an axiom saying there are far more Ur elements than there are sets. Um, and if you remain silent, that's on something what Yao like that, does. So that's what Yao does, except we, yeah. we happen to be working over Morse instead of over Scott Potter. I mean, yeah. But, but if you if, if you just remain silent on that, if you literally say nothing whatsoever about the Ur elements, if you uh, then then that's the weakening that you'll you'll care about for it breaking, right? Yeah, but, because but that's it will also have a model weakening. It's it's also a weakening of ZF. I mean, yeah, so yeah. I don't think the Scott Potter issue seems it's exactly the same. I don't see. Well, it's, it's it's just nice because you don't need anything like um, replacement or uh, you, you don't need the hierarchy to be very tall. You know, you could have a hundred Ur elements and only three levels in the hierarchy, um, and that that gives you a, a a problem case. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, let's see. Um, sorry. Is there is there a question from Michael? I haven't. 
indeed caught it. Somebody's drawn it to my attention. But Michael Potter. Yes. Um, when you were comparing um, your work with Bell 1994, you commented that the monotheoretic stuff, in a sense, is external, so you don't really know inside the system what you're getting. But, of course, your method, you're depending on a girdle numbering of the formulae, and a different girdle numbering would give you different um, extension. Yes. yes. Um, and of course, I, that's pretty much inevitable that you're not going to find a natural way of picking out in you know, a way that's stable. To, but I suppose that's a respect in which what you're doing is therefore unfregean, in that Freg at least hoped the basic law of five was a law of logic. And if it's a law of logic, then it, it shouldn't be subject to the vagaries of which girdle numbering you happen to have picked. Right, I think that's- I don't think there's any way of avoiding that. It's just that, you know, if it would, if basic law five per impossibly were a law of logic, it would, it would therefore have to have a kind of an inevitability and naturalness. It would have to be canonical in the way that math mathematicians talk about things being canonical. I think that's completely right. Yeah, I agree with all of that. 